My name's Madeline Maupin, and I am called a Bible scholar, but I would prefer to just call myself a Bible student. I love the scriptures. I was raised on them. I was raised in the denomination of Christian science, but to me, the Bible is for all of us, for all mankind. My name is Eric Nelson, and I am the legislative and media spokesperson for Christian science in Northern California. Uh, Christian Science is a religion that was uh, founded by Mary Baker Eddy in the late 19th century. Um, and Mary Baker Eddy said that she founded her religion largely uh, based on her understanding, her, her reading, her study of the Bible. And of course that includes both the Old and the New Testament. Um, healing was very much a part of what she taught in Christian Science. And of course, she took her cue from, from Jesus Christ in the, in the New Testament. So yes, Christian Science is first and foremost a, a Christian religion. Well, Christ, Christian Science is really all about following Christ Jesus in the way he asks us to. Uh, we take very seriously the commission of Christ Jesus to us uh, to be Christians, to follow his example, to live in accordance with what he taught. And so that's why we're Christian. So I love your question, what's the end game? And I'd say whether you're a student of Christian science or any Christian, it's to know God. That's my end game. And I think it's the end game Christ Jesus came to talk about. So what the Bible is, is a way for all of us to understand that. I think of it as God's love letters to us through, you know, a couple of thousand years. And so if, if the goal is to try to understand who God is, then by doing that, we actually understand who we are. I think one of my favorite sections of the Bible is in the New Testament in Romans where Paul writes a letter, words to the effect that nothing can separate him from the love of God. I go to that, it's Romans 8, I go to it all the time. And, and Paul, no matter what he's been through, we all know the life that he led, for him to write that, that absolutely nothing, whatever has been in the past, whatever is going on right now, whatever might happen in the future, nothing can separate him from the love of God, and then he ends up by saying, which is in Christ Jesus. And to me that's saying, Christ Jesus is the one who reminded me of that inseparability with God. There's a wonderful text in the very beginning of the scriptures that is such a holy part of the Jewish Hebrew Bible in Genesis of the Torah. And it's where it talks about God making man in his own image and likeness. Well, we have a new puppy. And one day I realized he had never seen himself. He didn't know what he looked like. So I picked him up in my arms and held him in front of the mirror and he started growling at his reflection. And then he realized it must be him in my arms because he knew what I looked like. And I've thought that is exactly our relationship to God. If Genesis says man is the reflection of God, then we really are looking into that mirror called God to figure out who we are. Heaven and hell are not places. It's really more of an experience uh, in the Old Testament, it, it wasn't placed until Jesus' time, and then there's some other religious traditions uh, that were not in the Jewish tradition, uh, had the sense of heaven and hell as places, and Jesus began to refer metaphorically to heaven and hell as places. But it's really a metaphor, because his whole message was that the kingdom of heaven is here and now, and that's what's essential. Uh, from the biblical point of view, heaven really is the state of being with God and hell is the state of being separated from God. So heaven, as many people define it, is somewhere after this experience on earth, just like hell is its opposite, sometime after earth. But I think we're finding that it's much more about a state of thought. I take my cue directly from Jesus. He was the one who said, you know, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is within you and that kingdom of heaven is at hand. To me, that implies there's no waiting. It's something we can open ourselves up to 
right here and right now. We don't need to wait for it. But it's also something beyond that. It's something that we can benefit from right here and right now. Whether that means a, a, a peace of mind, a sense of assurance of God's love, or a physical healing that can result simply from that, that idea that this kingdom of heaven is within and it's at hand. Jesus did not teach about life after death, uh, that there was another life after death. He taught that life is eternal, here and now and always, that there is really no death, that the human experience is a spiritual experience that is continuous and that if it's continuous then when are we going to get to heaven? We need to get to heaven now uh, and, and, that's, and that's by having more of a sense of the presence and power of God in our life. It seems to me that every single teaching of Jesus was followed by a healing and that is especially pronounced in the Gospel of John. The whole Gospel is structured around seven signs. And the seven signs are the I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the bread of life. Well, if it's I am the bread of life, he follows it with the feeding of the multitudes of the 5,000. If it's I am the light of the world, he follows it with the healing of blind men. Well. That to me is the kingdom of heaven come through Jesus saying, you look blind, but in the kingdom of heaven, there is no blindness. And I'm going to show you it's right here. And he heals them and they can see. Jesus' life was spent healing people. We wonder, well, why did he spend so much time healing people? Uh, of physical ills and of overcoming sin because uh, that's the way God gets your attention. It's not the end game, but it is the way God gets our attention to tell us that God really makes a difference in our life. And that's really what it's about. It's really about waking us up to God is present, God has power in our life, and so let's begin to apply it to bringing more harmony to every aspect of life, to drug addiction, to violence in the community, to everything we're dealing with. When I have a, any kind of a healing, whether it's a relationship healing, an emotional healing, or a physical healing, a physical cure of something, sometimes that's, that's my cue that I'm actually in heaven. It's, it's actually a confirmation that I have arrived. As I was saying earlier, for a Christian scientist, heaven isn't so much a locality, a place, as it is a, a, a divinely inspired state of consciousness. So I see healing and heaven kind of working in tandem with one another. Is there a spiritual Jesus? No. There's no spiritual Jesus. The spiritual Jesus is the Christ. That's how unique he was. You know, and that's what we need to see is that, whoa, we're talking about something really different here then, aren't we? Yeah, Jesus was the man, but, you know, his spiritual nature was the Christ, and that's what's eternal. That's what makes him unique. And so then you begin to say, so, whoa, then when other people talk about Jesus coming to be with them, they're using the wrong word, but it's very similar to what we think. It is the Christ that we're talking about, and they say Jesus, but it's really just words. It's, it's the same sense of this presence of God with us. I look at the life of Jesus Christ as really as one big reminder of how much God loves me. And even that one simple thought has literally saved me from all kinds of problems throughout my life, whether it was relationship difficulties or problems at work, physical healings that have come about, again, from that simple reminder that God loves me. And that's a message that not just Jesus' words, but his very life expressed. And it's, a, it's literally a saving message. So I very much consider Jesus to be my savior. Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. That meant Bedouin, uh, uh, even today, there are three-sided pens all through the Middle East, and the shepherd would sleep as the fourth line of the pen, so that once the sheep got in and he literally laid his body across, they all calmed down. And I think that's what Jesus is for us. He's a literal shepherd to help us understand 
There are a lot of wolves out there, but they're not wolves like four-legged animals. They're all the kind of nasty, undermining thoughts. Do this, do that. They're all the temptations that would trip us up. And that's why Jesus is our shepherd. And that's why Christian scientists are so aligned with Christians. That's who we look to as our role model, as our exemplar, as our mediator, as the Hebrew author talked about him. So how do we learn the kingdom? We look to Jesus and he really teaches us what it's like. Why do we need to be saved? Because of the ever-present experience of sin and disease and death all around us. Jesus came to save us from all of that, sin, disease, and death. And what is sin? Not just bad people or people being bad, but a feeling of separation from God and then operating uh, under the will of other powers or trying to force our will on other people, trying to do good uh, separate from God, which is actually futile. What we need to do is overcome all of these sin, disease, and death. That was his commission to his disciples and his followers to overcome these. Well, how do we overcome these? By getting closer to God, by starting with a recognition that God is present. Can a sinful mortal become an unsinful mortal? I would say no, that what Jesus is saying is we're going to change the entire platform. And when, when someone is healed, like a leper becomes pure again, or a Mary Magdalene becomes, you know, and no longer is an adulteress, or Levi is no longer greedy, whatever the transformation is of character of the body, it's a glimpse at who we are. So salvation is a glimpse into man as this image of God. It's being saved from the whole mortal dream. Salvation comes in any number of ways. It may come from my individual prayer. It may come from reading the Bible. Any way I'm able to get back in touch again with that simple message that I have this connection with God, that I can't be separated from God, that God literally loves me and cares for me. That's my salvation. When I can hold on to that thought, I, I feel I'm good to go. And there are many passages throughout the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, in Ephesians, it talks about, you know, what Christ came to teach us. And you really get this sense that Christ came to kind of say, wake up. You're made in God's image. You're pure. Let's act like that. Let's make a big distinction between sin. Paul uses the term sarx, the Greek word, Greek word which means flesh. It's where our English word sarcophagus comes from. It just means a flesh-eating box. But sarx is this term where kind of sin dwells. But we're so much more than that. And so I love to think of salvation as throwing off these things that have gotten imposed on who man is. And we begin to realize, wow, we are free to be this image of God. And as we see that, we experience salvation right now. Mary Baker Eddy uh, called herself the discoverer and founder of Christian science. And, and she was. She did discover this science of the Christ, that there is a way to follow Christ Jesus. Jesus was called the way shower in the early days. And we pick that up and say, well, he is the way. He's taught us how to follow him. And if we follow him in the way he taught us, then uh, this was a discovery, a, kind of a, a new old discovery of what it means to be a Christian, how to really follow that. And so she discovered uh, that there was an underlying principle, an underlying law of God that you could turn to and consistently feel the blessing of following it. Mary Baker Eddy often said, Look, I don't want you to take my words at face value. I encourage you to do your own work. In fact, uh, speaking of her interpretation of the Bible, she said, look, don't take my word for it. In so many words, you need to decide for yourself if I've given you the correct interpretation of Scripture. The difficulty most people have with Mary Baker Eddy, who are not Christians, is that she's a woman. Uh, and uh, that can a woman found a faith? 
uh, in her day, particularly, it was very difficult for a woman to be in a, any leadership roles in a, a Christian church and in most churches. And it hasn't changed a lot today, although there are lots of women ministers and women bishops. Uh, things are changing, and, and hopefully so. And so there's more of an acceptance of women. So it's much easier to accept Mary Baker Eddy uh, and her teachings as someone who can speak with authority in a Christian context. Mm -hmm.